Okay, folks, well, this is going to be kind of our last Lisp session for a while, so I wanted to kind of wrap up talking about pure functional programming and how our version of Lisp definitely isn't, but how we could take some steps to work with it in a more pure fashion. So this is kind of where we'll wrap things up for the Lisp side of life. So again, in a, a pure functional programming philosophy, Everything's a function returning a value. You don't have state. You don't have sequence. You don't have side effects. Uh, you have no kind of explicit ordering of steps. Everything's just function calls and returns. So obviously, the common Lisp we've been dealing with is impure in a ton of different ways. You know, if um, we did talk about the idea that with pure functional programming, without state and without side effects, it makes analysis much further, much simpler. It makes testing much simpler. And so proofs of correctness, testing, all of that is done in a more simple fashion. Um, automated parallelization is simpler. Just throw the different function calls at different processors and you're done. But we've got a lot of impurities to deal with that prevent most of our common Lisp code from effectively being supportive of those ideas. Right, there are a ton of different places where we allow explicit use of variables. So things like def vars and lets and the you know implicit setfs and let stars and um, all of the different uh, do's and uh, with open file type of thing where we have a bunch of implicit local variables. Right, All of this has stored state associated with it. There are a ton of places where we permit explicit sequencing of steps, right? In blocks, in let blocks, in function bodies. There are all sorts of places where we allow the specification of do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. Right? There are a ton of different places where we've seen side effects are possible, right? Because we're really passing around pointers to items rather than the items themselves. So the idea of passing a parameter to a uh, or passing a list as a parameter to a function and then allowing that function to set, you know, the car or set the nth item or something like that changes the original list. So it's clearly, very clearly not functionally pure. Now, we could provide impure syntax but a pure implementation behind the scenes. So we could do something like using macros to let the programmer use syntax that looks impure, but have it rewrite, have it rewritten into a pure form. Right? So there might be an efficiency cost associated with that, but it might be worth it if the purity is really desired. So if you want to give the, the programmer the, the look and feel of, uh, of an impure hybrid language, but still have pure functionality behind the scenes. So what we'll do is take a look at how we might actually do that, some steps that we could take. So let's say we've got a function with local variables and we want to rewrite it in a way that doesn't use local variables. So we get this function, uh, defun f of x, we're going to have a let block with two local variables, a and b, and they both get read from values the user provides and then we use them in some computation. And what we want is to rewrite that in a fashion that's functionally pure, that doesn't use local variables. So the idea would be we introduce a new function, kind of a hidden private function, that takes the two original parameters as parameters, but it also takes a and b as parameters. So now we've got this, func this hidden function that takes four parameters and does the final computation on them. And the way we get the initial values into those parameters is to pass the functions that the original version used to set them. So originally we said set you know a to read and b to the result of a read. So now our function f just calls this hidden function passing the original x, the original y, and the two calls to read. So now f is functionally pure and our hidden function is functionally pure. We've just got this hidden layer of abstraction, right? this hidden extra function call taking place. So we can get rid of this sort of local variables using a rewrite. 
handling sequences is a little bit uglier if we want to maintain purity. So let's say I wanted my function to do something like print a message and then do a read afterwards. So we could say something like, let's have an if where we make the first thing we want to do, the prompt, the condition for our if, and then regardless of the result, we follow up with the second step. We do a read if the function was true, or we do a read if the function was false. So no matter what, we carry out these two things in sequence. Now, that does assume that the compiler has to, or that the that when Lisp runs, it has to evaluate that first function in order to perform the second one. So, you know, there are some, some caveats to this, but it does allow us to, to enforce some sequencing. Now, obviously, if this second thing is a fairly complex function call, we're going to be replicating it twice. Only one of them is going to run, but in the source code, the rewritten source code, it's going to get kind of larger and uglier. And if we've got um, three steps that we're trying to do, then we're saying, okay, well, you know, rewrite the, f do the first rewrite to get it, to get the first two steps in sequence, and then treat that first rewrite and the, the final step as, you know, the, the two steps to resequence next. So this could get fairly ugly fairly quickly in terms of the size of the code we rewrite, but theoretically it could be done. Eliminating side effects might be a little bit on the nastier side for uh, our implementation, right? The current issue that we've got when we're passing a list as a parameter is that we're passing a pointer to the thing. And so if we go through that pointer and change the contents, you're actually changing the original. And it all comes down to this idea that, you know, you're passing pointers, not, uh, you're not passing a value copy of the list. So, a solution would be to actually pass the lists by value. So that would mean every time you pass a list as a parameter, you actually make a copy of it and pass the copy. So you can see how if you've got big lists and a lot of recursion, then you're constantly making these copies of the list or a portion of it and passing them as parameters. So you are doing a lot of extra steps in copying the list over and over and over again for these recursive calls. And if it's not tail recursive, then you're also putting all that stuff on the stack as well. Well, I guess actually you're putting pointers to them on the stack the way it's currently implemented and putting the, the items themselves in the heap. But even so, you're going through and creating a lot of duplicate data as the recursion plows along. So it could be... Uh, fairly intense in terms of memory and in terms of just runtime performance with respect to speed because you've got all these copy operations to carry out. So we can go through and take care of a lot of the issues. We could perform uh, sort of macro level rewrites to get relatively pure behavior. It's just at the, the cost of um, runtime efficiency for the most part, um, code size and speed of execution. So just thoughts to keep in mind um, in terms of pure and impure, what, uh, what we are capable of doing and just what the costs, what, what costs are associated with that. All right, I will leave that there. In our next sessions, we're going to start looking at uh, formal grammars as a thing unto themselves, and then we'll look at language descriptions and start getting into more of an analysis of potential language features in a general sense and look at implementation issues and start comparing and contrasting some of the things that we see in C versus Java versus Lisp versus Python versus whatever other languages we happen to want to play with. But we'll save that for next time.